Welcome to the University Church and welcome to this uh, second uh, occasion for the Bampton Lecturers, uh, for the Bampton Lecturers in which our distinguished speaker, Peter Harrison, will be giving the addresses on uh, science and divine purpose, following on last week from Modern Myths About Science and Religion. Uh, my name is Martin Percy. Uh, I'm the Dean of Christ Church, but for purposes here, uh, I am the uh, Chair of the Bampton Electors, and it's a great uh, privilege and uh, joy to uh, welcome you all here. Uh, I want to say something, if I can, just about the lectures themselves. Uh, they have been going since uh, 1780, and uh, they are, by tradition, uh, public lectures on points of Christian theology, which my notes tell me uh, occasionally from time to time um, have attracted uh, uh, either adverse attention or have been the subject of some uh, notoriety. Um, since the turn of the 20th century, they have been every two years, and uh, speakers over the last 100 years um, have included, amongst others, E.L. Maskell, Peter Belts, Arthur Peacock, John A.T. Robinson, Maurice Wiles, Alistair McGrath, Colin Gunton, Ursula King, Francis Young, John Habgood, uh, Paul Fides, and more recently Michael Banner, David Ford, and George Patterson. It's a great pleasure this year to be having uh, Peter Harrison, who is an Australian Laureate Fellow and Director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at the University of Queensland. Previously, he held the Andreas Idrios Chair in Science and Religion at the University of Oxford and has served as director of Oxford's Ian Ramsey Centre as well, so he's no stranger to us. He's published extensively in the field of intellectual history with a focus on the philosophical, scientific, and religious thought of the early modern period, and has written more generally on the historical relations between science and religion. He's the author of more than 100 articles and chapters, and his eight books include the Bible, Protestantism, and the Rise of Natural Science, The Cambridge Companion to Science and Religion, The Territories of Science and Religion, and his most recent book, Science Without God, question mark, Rethinking the History of Scientific Naturalism, which has just been published by Oxford University Press. The format for these lectures is that Peter will speak for about 45 minutes, then there will be uh, a little bit of Q&A, then there'll be a coffee break, and then uh, at 11.30, we will recommence with the second lecture. Then there's a break for lunch. And uh, after that, there is uh, a seminar-style uh, gathering in the afternoon uh, till, uh, from about 1.30 till uh, 3 o'clock, no later than that, uh, which will be in the upper library. But if you could uh, join me in welcoming back uh, Peter Harrison, our Bampton lecturer for 2019. Well, thank you, Martin, for that generous introduction, and uh, it's good to see so many of you back, um, your suckers for punishment. I will uh, refer back to the lectures from last week uh, in a moment, but let, let me just launch into what I'm going to speak about this week directly. Almost a hundred years ago, the Canadian philosopher Roy Wood Sellers announced in his groundbreaking book, Evolutionary Naturalism, that we are all naturalists now. Seller conceded that the precise content of this pervasive naturalism was difficult to pin down, but he offered a twofold characterization. We understand naturalism primarily in terms of what it rules out. So naturalism, he says, has always arisen in opposition to what we might call supernatural propositions, whether these are the naive mythical explanations of the world that we find in primitive religions or supernatural popular metaphysics. Now, on the positive side of the leisure, naturalism was to be equated with a scientific perspective, a view of the world which flows from the inner necessity from the accomplishments of science, says Sellers. So Sellers indeed proposes that, quote, the spirit of naturalism would seem to be one with the spirit of science itself. Science, naturalism, and the rejection of supernatural entities, in short, are all pretty much the same thing. 
Now, Seller's claim for the ubiquity of naturalism appears to be even more true now than when he first advanced it, certainly in our intellectual communities. Naturalism remains the fundamental working assumption of the natural and social sciences and the default commitment of most of us who work in the humanities. Philosophers who've reflected most deeply on uh, how it is we know what we know and what there is to know seem particularly enthusiastic to sign up to naturalism in both of the senses specified by Sellers. So in, da in 2015, just uh, three years ago, David Papineau uh, writes then that the majority, the great majority of contemporary philosophers would happily uh, accept the label naturalism and here again, the two components of it, that is, they reject supernatural entities and they allow that science, here's a slightly more modest claim for science, science is a possible, uh, if not the only uh, way to explore uh, the human spirit. Now these contentions about naturalism leave the historian with three intriguing questions. First, how did modern science, which at its birth in the 17th century had been underpinned by theological presuppositions, legitimated by religious values, and regularly pursued by individuals who were motivated by personal piety, come now to be identified with a view of the world that rules out the supernatural? And for now, you're going to have to take my word for it that, that science did in fact have those features at its birth, and I'll talk about that later in this and the next lecture. The second question we have is, how is it that philosophers over the past 100 years have increasingly come to reject the existence of supernatural entities when the overwhelming consensus of the philosophical community up until late modernity had been in favour of some form of theism and very often traditional Christian theism? And the third one, how and when did this terminology of naturalism and supernaturalism originate, given that it plays virtually no role in either scientific or philosophical discussions prior to the mid-19th century? And as I will argue, the changing terminology and the appearance of this terminology of naturalism is a kind of smoking gun that points to a key historical moment. Now, I want to hit the pause button here and we're going to go back to what we spoke about last week and then I'll come back to these questions. So we started last week with David Hume pointing out that we seem to live in a different world to that of our predecessors. For Hume, and this is oversimplifying things a bit, this is because they were primitive, credulous and prone to making things up and we are not. Hume would get support from Enlightenment and social scientific models of history, models that set out an inexorable historical process according to which societies will transition necessarily from a religious magical stage to a scientific stage. And this travel was seen as in the right direction. Now from the other side, those thinkers more sympathetic to religion, and my example here was Charles Taylor, agree that we live in a different world now, but are less convinced that this has been for the best. Taylor thus speaks of our impermeability to spiritual forces as an impoverishment and a loss. And sitting, I think, somewhere between these positions uh, is someone like uh, the New Testament scholar and theologian Rudolf Bultmann, who famously made this comment uh, and who thought that we do need to divest ourselves of the mythologies to which our predecessors subscribed, and he seems to insist that there is no going back, in the second paragraph, to some pristine enchanted world of the past, because our present thinking, he says, is irrevocably formed, is the word he uses, geformed, formed by science. At the same time, Bultmann does not think, as did some of his predecessors, that Christianity will disappear without remainder if demythologized, and he readily acknowledges that modern science too is a myth. And so we, he says, I, I don't intend to replace the New Testament myth with science. Uh, faith must be freed from bondage to all kinds of mythology, including science. Uh, and the key is not philosophical discussion, but faith and obedience. These features of the Bultmann's program are, are often uh, forgotten. Now, one further thing about Bultmann's position, when he speaks about being formed by science, he makes reference to the electric light and to the wireless, not to the laws of physics. 
Bultmann does not say this explicitly, but my take on this is that our constant interactions with modern technologies are rituals that link our habits and behaviours to an implicit faith in the scientific truths that we imagine make this technology work. So in this sense, it's our practices, our continual engagement with ever-improving technologies that serve to reinforce the legitimacy of the truth claims of the modern sciences. And there's much more to be said about that, and I think the, the connection between Bultmann and Heidegger is, is interesting, but we certainly don't want to get into Heidegger this morning, or perhaps ever. So we finished the last lecture last week uh, with my suggestion that perhaps Bultmann was onto something with his recognition that our scientific worldview was no less mythological than the worldviews that it had displaced. And this suggests to me one, one possibility, and that's the possibility of turning Bultmann's demythologization program through 180 degrees and training its sights on features of the scientific worldview that seem to render belief in the supernatural problematic. Again, I should be clear about the scope of this tentative project. Bultmann's original agenda was not an anti-Christian one aimed at showing it to be untrue. My intention, similarly, is not to dismiss the various activities that fall under the label science as mythical or untrue, but rather to identify narratives and myths that have been attached to science and which constitute stumbling blocks for those seeking to hold together a confidence in science and a commitment to the supernatural or the transcendental. Now, I must confess up front to a mild degree of mild equivocation about my use of myth and mythology. So let me stipulate what I'm talking about here. For my immediate purposes, I will understand it in the sense of false, his false histories that have been attached to science and false philosophical implications that are presumed to follow from some of the doctrines and practices of science. So again, my goal is not to attack science as such, but to expose the myth misleading narratives that have been attached to it and which are often assumed to be objective truths about the past. And this brings us back after this D22 hour three questions, and here they are again. And let me give you again some tentative answers. The answer to the first of these, I think, is straightforwardly that influential figures in the late 19th century seeking to establish a science that of its very essence was inimical to claims about God or spiritual realities invented a history that purported to show that science from the very beginning and that beginning was taken to be with the ancient Greeks, had been intrinsically naturalistic. And the naturalistic is their term. The success of science throughout history on this model was inversely proportional to the power and influence wielded by the forces of the supernaturalists. Naturalism was everywhere opposed throughout history to supernaturalism on this account. Human progress in general was identified with scientific progress, and the latter in turn was identified with the success of naturalism. And this then helps us with the other two questions as well. Many philosophers, not to put too fine a point on it, keen to ride on the coattails of an apparently progressive science, uh, simply have bought into the historical myth. Brings to mind Nietzsche's, uh, Nietzsche's little uh, reference in Human All Too Human that lack of historical sense is the congenital defect of philosophers. Harsh, but sometimes I, I fear it's true. As for the terminology of the naturalism supernatural distinction, our third question, uh, as for this uh, terminology, it was expressly invented, or as we shall see, adapted uh, from. Uh, another sphere, and so it was adapted because scientific. Sorry, it was adapted because nineteenth-century mythmakers needed this conceptual distinction in order to make their histories work. The trick was to make it appear as if this was just an obvious, unassailable feature. How everyone in every culture and in every historical period had thought about the world. That is to say, in terms of this fundamental distinction between natural and supernatural. Now, as we saw in the last lecture, there is nothing intrinsic to the scientific enterprise that lends itself to this kind of opposition to religion or belief in the supernatural. It's rather the attribution to science of a special role in the, the trajectory of history that is key to the setting up of this opposition. 
Thus the simple claim of a historical transition from primitive to civilised that we see in Hume will be elaborated in the tripartite schemes of uh, Kant, we saw this, and Tyler, the anthropologist Tyler, and the anthropologist uh, James George Fraser. And, and so these are the, the, the previous models of history. Now, crucially, this placing of science into history is not the work of scientists themselves, but is the work of social scientists and, to a lesser extent, historians. And the context in which it takes place is not science, uh, but rather a theory or history of human development. Going back further, it's interesting that to some degree these progressive schemes are themselves indebted to a questionable structuring of history uh, that Protestant polemicists introduced in the 16th and 17th centuries. I'm just going to have a quick look at that. So the English philosopher Francis Bacon uh, would draw a parallel between the religious reformation and the reformation of knowledge, or as we would now say in the somewhat unfashionable term perhaps, the scientific revolution. So the scientific revolution follows on from the Protestant Reformation. So in our age, he says, when it pleased God to call the Church of Rome to account for their degenerate manners and ceremonies, etc., it was at the same time ordained by divine providence that there should be a renewal and a new spring of all knowledge, the rise of science. And Bacon himself was a key figure in uh, effecting this transition. Bacon also hints at an eschatological dimension to this pro process with his allusion to a passage here on the frontispiece. Um, I've just magnified it there, allusion to Daniel 12.4, the prophecy that links the rise of knowledge with the voyages of discovery. Going back further, Protestant polemicists themselves would speak of the Reformation as having brought light after darkness. And this is the motto of the city of Geneva, light after darkness. So the imagery of enlightenment as a, a, a historical shift actually dates back to Protestant structuring of history. Um, and here's another example from the, the Puritan thinker Cotton Mather. Incredible darkness was over Europe, and then we have the reformation of religion and the reformation of knowledge. Okay? So we have a historical shift with science being inserted into it by these Protestant polemicists. Now what's of, of significance in these developments is that science, or strictly speaking we should say natural philosophy, is for the first time written into history as something that has providential or eschatological significance. And uh, local historian Charles Webster has written a terrific book on the eschatological elements of scientific change in England in the middle decades of the 17th century. And then so in what will then become a standard pattern in the trajectory of Western modernity, the original context for the appearance of the writing of science into history will disappear and will be gradually displaced by secular stories, and in this case, narratives of progress that are, in a sense, secularised versions of eschatology or providential history. In this classic book by Carl Becker, it's an old book, but it tells that story very well. Now, the next stage of the story is when the French philosopher of the Enlightenment expand the scope of the Protestant critique of Catholicism to apply to all of religion, all of religion. And so here is Condorcet, same principle, but now it's applied generally to the whole of Christianity and not just Catholicism. And again, note the, the context is the, the big case for the progress of the human spirit. This is what the progress of the human spirit is about. And so the myth-making begins as a number of key Enlightenment thinkers who for the most part were not themselves engaged in scientific activity, appropriate the new sciences to craft a narrative of progress, and we hear this story rehearsed to the present day. It's one of the, uh, it's, it's one of the core myths of modernity, if we put it that way. The linking of science with progress and the opposition of both to the supposedly inhibitory forces of religion became a key to Enlightenment propaganda sense of their own special place in history. And in a recent and terrific book on the Enlightenment, the Stanford historian Dan Edelstein sums this up well. 
He says, the narrative of the new science, progressively dismantling all remnants of superstition and scholasticism, in its way was central to the self-perception of the philosophe. Their very identity depended on it. The consciousness of their place in the historical trajectory, which crested in the present, endowed their worldly in- interventions with greater meaning. And precisely the same is true for those who in the present rehearse this myth. Edelstein goes on to maintain that this enlightened model of history is the story we tell about ourselves, our values, our government and our religions. More than just a story, it was and remains a master narrative of modernity, a myth. And because this myth is, is vital to the, to the identity and self-understanding of those who originated it and who continue to perpetuate it, it's extremely difficult to dislodge and it becomes impervious to the demythologizing efforts of historians. And the most recent episode in this story is Steven Pinker's most recent book, Enlightenment Now, which runs precisely this narrative. Now, so this is a myth of modernity that has a number of variations. It starts with Protestant critiques of putatively superstitious and backward Catholicism and divides history along these lines. The enlightened idea of a gradual triumph of reason over religious dogma and the later notion of a perennial battle between science and religion. And we've seen these characters before, but I'll give them again. Here is uh, John Draper's famous book, History of the Conflict Between Science and Religion, 1874. It could easily have been a history of the conflict between Catholicism and science because it rehearses the original Protestant accusation of Catholicism's anti-scientific attitude. And you can read that there for yourself. Protestantism, okay. Catholics, the bad guys, the superstitious ones. The other great 19th century originator of the science-religion conflict thesis, Andrew Dixon White, drew more upon the stages of history approach of enlightenment history, the the sorts of stages that we see in Auguste Comte. And thus he will speak uh, of two epochs in the evolution of human thought. So again we have the idea that science is being written in to history as marking uh, something of vital importance. Now historians of science have dealt with these two characters, Draper and White, um, as myth makers in serious detail and considerable detail and no serious historian accepts this thesis of a conflict between science and religion. Let me give you a number of the the wonderful but to some degree futile books that have been written attempting to refute the conflict thesis between science and religion. The very first Idrios professor here at Oxford, John Brooks, wonderful book, Science and Religion and Some Historical Perspectives. Uh, we realised that that was too sophisticated and so the, 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 the other two, the next two, are directed more at popular audiences. Galileo goes to jail and other myths about science and religion. And then increasingly desperate, the idea that wouldn't die, the warfare between science and religion, which came out uh, last year. So if you want the demythologizing story of the conflict myth, there's plenty of, uh, plenty of sources for it. So I'm not going to focus on that here. At one level, that job has been done. What I do want to focus on is the closely related but less well-traversed territory of the emergence of scientific naturalism because I think that provides the rationale for this this, uh, subsidiary myth, as it were, about a perennial conflict between science and religion. So the story of naturalism, I would argue, is even more fundamental. It's an even more fundamental myth. So while various components of science, religion, myths have been coalescing from the Protestant Reformation onwards, the key moment when everything comes together is the 19th century. This is partly because then for the first time we get a fully developed conception of modern science, a science that's understood in terms of what it excludes, namely religious and supernatural considerations. So if we want to get a sense of the first uses of science in this term, here's a definition from 1867 from the Dublin Review by uh, W.G. Ward. He says, we shall use the word science in the sense which Englishmen now commonly give to it as expressing physical and experimental science to the exclusion of the theological and the metaphysical, the exclusion of the theological and the metaphysical. 
So science up until this point had just simply referred to systematised knowledge or knowledge based on demonstration. Now it has a special meaning defined in terms of what it is that it excludes. So the compound expression science and religion only, be only becomes possible in the 19th century. And here is a word frequency chart looking at all of the occurrences of this phrase in English books from the late 18th century up until 2000. No one spoke about science and religion essentially before the 19th century. And why didn't they? Because the concept science was not formulated in such a way that it could be set up in opposition to religion. Okay, and this book is the story about how that how that opposition happens and how science is invented as a category in such a way that makes possible an opposition between uh, science and religion. Now the next part of the story then is how in the wake of the formation of these two categories, science and religion, one came to be identified with naturalism and one came to be identified with supernaturalism. And you can guess which is which. So here again we have the frequency of the term naturalism. No one talks about naturalism before the 19th century as a category. It's an invention of the 19th century, as is supernaturalism. And uh, add these, well, let me go back to that one. I'll put them all up so you can see the pattern, but you, you, it, it's not, you don't have to be a mathematical genius to, to see what's going on here. Um, What's striking, I think, is, and this is the, the, great, uh, the great irony, is that for the vast period of history supposedly characterised by supernaturalism, there was never ever a word to describe what it is that characterised that period. So here's another version of the graph going from the first century to the end of uh, 1990. There are the, the occurrences of the word supernaturalism and ironically, this is the period that was supposed to characterise supernaturalism and they never had a word for what it was. So uh, paradoxically then, the conception emerges precisely at the moment when it's supposed to have disappeared as a live option. And there we have them all. So there's some connection here, all right? I, mean, I know correlation doesn't imply causation, but there's clearly some connection between the invention of naturalism, the invention of the term supernaturalism, and I would argue that they are codependent, and our understandings of how science and religion need to be placed in a particular relationship with each other. Okay, so how do we get the invention of naturalism? The key figure in the English-speaking world for the mobilisation of the idea of scientific naturalism was Darwin's bulldog, Thomas Henry Huxley, and members of his circle who self-consciously labelled themselves scientific naturalists. Now, one of those graphs actually had the frequency of scientific naturalist, and it comes a little bit after naturalism, but um, you, when the book comes out, you, you can see the picture. Okay, in his essays on some controverted questions in 1892, Huxley identified and endorsed what he called, and I'm quoting here, the principle of scientific naturalism of the latter half of the 19th century. That principle was understood in terms of what it stood against, namely supernaturalism, which Huxley described as, quote, the product of an infantile and untutored reason that in the distant past had invented a world beyond and above nature, populating it with entities capable of changing the course of events at whim. Huxley maintained, as Sellers was later to do, that the opposition between naturalism and supernaturalism was a constantly recurring motif in the history of human thought. But the late 19th century, for Huxley, a special moment in history was marked by hopeful signs of the imminent triumph of the forces of naturalism. And so he says, the extant forces of supernaturalism have deep roots in human nature, and will undoubtedly die hard, but in these latter days, the eschatological talk, they have to cope with an enemy whose full strength is only just beginning to be put out, and whose forces gathering strength year by year are hemming them round on every side. This enemy is science. Now, in retrospect, and particularly for those who have come to endorse Huxley's view of history, the identification of science with naturalism and the pitting of both against supernaturalism seems obvious, but it was not so 
at the time. And those who advocated scientific naturalism met with significant opposition from different quarters. Many leading Victorian men of science were strongly committed to a theistic understanding of the, of the operations of nature. And at the time, natural theology was the most common medium for the popular communication of the contents of scientific discoveries. There was also a broad consensus shared by naturalists and the religiously committed alike on the integrity of the laws of nature and the principle of the conservation of energy. For pious scientists, however, these principles had originated in and were underwritten by theological assumptions and hence were far from implying uh, metaphysical naturalism. The uniformity of nature, in other words, had typically been taken as evidence in favour of the divine superintendence of the natural world rather than as evidence against it. Further complicating the picture was the efflorescence in the late 19th century of a remarkable alliance of science and spiritualism. A significant number of leading scientists were committed to the empirical investigation of the spiritual world. A scientific outlook was thus entirely compatible with an openness to non-material realities. So there was nothing obvious at the time about an alliance between science and naturalism as we now understand it, and nothing inevitable about an alignment of both against the religious or spiritual understanding of the world. An additional difficulty was that, the, that at the beginning of the 19th century, as, these, as the graphs that we saw show, the relevant concepts, naturalism and supernaturalism, were simply not available. No one really thought that belief in supernatural entities was incompatible with scientific practice. Not least, again, because so many of the leading men of science, and they were, regrettably, but run by other men of science, were devout believers. Most of the key figures in, that most of the key figures in the development of modern science in the past had cherished strong religious commitments was also widely acknowledged. Accordingly, the notion that individuals could be divided without remainder into naturalists and or supernaturalists made little sense and no one thought in terms of these mutually exclusive isms. Now again, in retrospect to us, a basic distinction between natural and supernatural may seem self-evident, natural, and universal. But in, the, in fact, these categories are distinctly Western, and as we'll see in the next lecture, even in the West they emerge relatively late during the High Middle Ages and with connotations quite different to the connotations that they presently bear. For medieval thinkers who first observed the d distinction between the natural and supernatural, God was as intimately involved in the former uh, as the latter, either by concurring with natural causation or by conserving the natures of things uh, as they affected the relevant changes. I'll talk more about that in the next lecture. Now, while early modern thinkers, thinkers of the 17th century, would break away from this understanding of, uh, of, of nature, they too insisted that divine action uh, was as evident in the unvarying laws of the natural world as it was in the miracles recorded in the Bible. In fact, they were often more inclined than their medieval forebears to attribute natural causation to the direct operations of God. Again, we'll see this in the next lecture. This was not only true of the... the uh, okay, don't worry if you, know what I'm talk if you don't know what I'm talking about here. It's just by, just by the by, in a way. This was not only true of the occasionalism that's associated with Nicholas Marbranche and the Cartesians, but also the thinking of many English natural philosophers. At any rate, Victorian men of science inherited this understanding with the brilliant polymath John Herschel, whose uh, preliminary discourse on the study of natural philosophy served as an inspiration to the young Charles Darwin, uh, maintained that the laws of nature were nothing other than the immediate effects of the divine will. William Huell, master of Trinity College, Cambridge, and an equally brilliant polymath, agreed with this as assessment. And thus the contemplation of the material universe, he says, exhibits God as the author of the laws of material nature. Natural events on this understanding did not exclude the activity of a supernatural deity, but rather took it for granted. Neither was there any inconsistency in characterising particular historical events 
as the work of God or as divine judgments, while at the same time seeking to uh, find their natural causes. So the conviction that God made the, the sun to rise on the evil and the good and the rain to fall on the ju just and the unjust had never constituted a barrier to astronomical or meteorological investigations. Now, the transformation of a natural supernatural distinction into this strict dichotomy, this takes place in the 19th century, through the invention of mutually exclusive isms, naturalism and supernaturalism is, as I've said, an event of the late 19th century. These isms came to be understood as entailing competing views of the world that admitted of no middle ground. A mark of the novelty of this dichotomy uh, lies in the fact that the scientific naturalists needed to invent the relevant terminology or more strictly appropriate it. And it was not found among the methodological understandings of their scientific contemporaries, but in the sphere of German biblical criticism. Before the mid-19th century, the term supernaturalism was used almost exclusively in the context of higher criticism. One focus of historical criticism was the reports of miracles and wonders in the Bible, which was forced to contend with Hume's question of why miracles were common then, but rare or non-existent in the present. So first appearing in the late uh, 18th century German literature, supernaturalism, supernaturalismus, described the stance of those for whom biblical miracles were genuine manifestations of divine power and which lent authenticity to truths above human reason. The competing view was rationalism. Rationalism was, and occasionally, uh, naturalism, naturalism. Was. So supernaturalism was not originally opposed to naturalism but to rationalism. So I, I like this word stuff, so I'm just going to go on for a paragraph about the words and then we'll... We'll come back to the chase, so just bear with me for a while. So the rationalists didn't deny that putatively miraculous events had actually taken place, but they argued that they confirmed the truths of natural uh, religion, and sometimes they suggested that these miracles could be given naturalistic explanations. And these categories were kept in play uh, by theological controversy generated by the biblical criticism of the Tubigan school that was inaugurated by... Um, this chap Ferdinand Christian Bauer and the subsequent publication that I'll come to right uh, directly, um, David Friedrich Strauss's Life of Jesus. Bauer sought to apply Hegelian dialectic to the history of Christianity and he revolutionised the historical study of the biblical text through the methods of higher criticism. For our purpose, his significance lies in the fact that he, he was thought to have produced, in the words of one of his critics, I'm quoting here, a theory that makes Christianity a thing of purely natural origin. Right? Something that makes Christianity a purely natural event in history. That's really key. Again, though, there's nothing here suggesting a perennial struggle between naturalistic science and supernaturalistic religion. Bauer's sometime pupil, David Friedrich Strauss, went one further casting doubt on the historicity of the New Testament miracles. Strauss had read Hume on miracles and drew the conclusion, which is not actually in Hume, by the way, uh, that it's impossible for events contrary to the, to the laws of nature to take place. An event is not historical, uh, Strauss tells us, quoting here, when it, it is irreconcilable with the known and universal laws which govern the universe. And here he sets out the basic thesis. So our modern world, after many years of tedious research, by tedious I think he means, um, well, you know what he means, uh, has attained a conviction that all things are linked together by a chain of cause and effect which suffers no interruption. When therefore we meet with an account of certain phenomena or events of which it is either expressly stated or implied uh, that they were produced by God himself, such an account is in so far to be considered not historical. New Testament miracles for Strauss were less a fabrication on the part of the biblical writers than the, form, than the product of a form of thinking that's difficult for modern minds to grasp. Miracle reports, he said, originated in, quote, a period of civilization in which the imagination worked so powerfully that its illusions were believed as realities. What we see in these developments, then, is not um, 
sorry, what we see in these developments is essentially the application of naturalistic principles to, respectively, by Bauer, the history of Christianity, and by Strauss, the biblical text. In both cases, the goal was accurate historical reconstruction and had little to do with natural science. Rather, it involved historical reconstructions that were informed by speculations about the psychology of ancient peoples. For the first half of the 19th century, then, supernaturalism was primarily opposed to rationalism or anti-supernaturalism and deployed within the sphere of biblical criticism and theology more generally. Now, there's a long story about how these terms came across into English, but when they did, they were understood in much the same way. So here's the ninth edition of the Encyclopaedia Britannica, and under the heading Rationalism, it's the second paragraph that's key. Rationalism had its antithesis on the one hand with su in supernaturalism, and on the other hand, naturalism or, or, or simple deism. So rationalism is actually opposed to these two categories. So it's kind of mixed up. But what we have here is the terminology, which is key. Now, there are a few intermediate steps in the story. I'm going to cut, cut those out so we can, we can uh, get to the nub of it. Cutting a long story short, we see three publications in England that shape the subsequent discussion of scientific naturalism and the migration of these two categories from the realm of biblical criticism into talk about science and its history. Okay. The first, the, the obvious choice, and you're, you're probably going to figure this one out, is The Origin of Species that appeared in 1859. And this book, in Andrew White's somewhat exaggerated um, assessment, impacted on the theological scene, quote, like a plough into an anthill. But in reality, even more controversial works were published on either side of this book, The Origin. The results of German higher criticism landed in England with a bang, with the 1860 publication four months after the appearance of Darwin's Origin in the collection Essays and Reviews. These were written by seven, seven liberal Anglican thinkers, six clergymen and one layman, the seven against Christ as they, they became known, and these essays presented the case based largely on the results of German higher criticism for naturalistic readings of biblical and pre-biblical history. And some measure of the impact of this collection can be gleaned from the fact that it sold more copies in two years than Darwin's origin did in 20. The third work, now this is fortuitous given our present context, was H.L. Mansell's Bampton Lectures of 1858 on the limits of religious thought. At the time, Mansell was the Wayne Fleet Professor of Metaphysical Philosophy here at Magdalen. Subsequently, he was the Regis Professor of Ecclesiastical History and then Dean of St Paul's. And his lectures set out a defence of Christian belief based on a version of the metaphysical agnosticism, although he didn't use that term, uh, uh, that he thought he had found in the philosophy of Kant. Now, as the distinguished historian of 19th century philosophy, uh, sorry, the distinguished historian of 19th century science, Bernard Lightman, has shown, this, the, the remarkable feature of the reception of this book, the book of the Bampton Lectures, was that while Mansell found virtually no defenders among his Christian co-religionists, his ideas had a significant influence on Thomas Henry Huxley, on John Tyndall, on Herbert Spencer. John Stuart Mill and others. Huxley, who later coined the term agnosticism to characterise his own views, and later he would prefer the label scientific naturalist, thus remarked that when he first read Mansell's Bampton Lectures, he immediately recognised a fellow agnostic. Now, it's really to his remarkable credit that uh, Thomas Henry Huxley read so much theology, uh, and indeed he read an incredible amount of uh, biblical criticism, and that's something we certainly can't say for uh, 21st century critics of um, scientifically motivated critics of religion. He was a guy of immense learning. By the second half of the 19th century, then, all of the pieces were in place. All of the prerequisites for the emergence of scientific naturalism were there. A terminology that opposed naturalism to supernaturalism, a well-developed literature on naturalistic approaches to history, albeit in the context of biblical criticism, and now with, with Mansell, an epistemology that could lend this naturalism a philosophical foundation. 
But none of these had arisen out of discussions about science or any of its disparate branches. Rather, they emerged from debates internal to Christianity. So the challenge for the new advocates of scientific naturalism was how to import these ideas into science and then make it appear as if naturalism and supernaturalism had been part of science all along and were not recent imports from the enterprise of biblical criticism, or to put it another way, they weren't just historically contingent developments that were part of a recent and parochial controversy within Christian theology. The solution then for men such as Thomas Henry Huxley and physicist John Tyndall uh, was to import this terminology, naturalism and supernaturalism, from the sphere of biblical criticism into the genre of the Enlightenment universal histories, those Enlightenment narratives that set out the progress of the human race from primitivism to civilization. The role they would now allocate to science was not the end point of this teleological or directional history, as it was for Kant, Tyler uh, and Fraser. Instead, scientific naturalism would be placed at the heart of history as the chief engine of progress. This entailed, in essence, inventing a history for science in which the central theme would be an ongoing competition between the forces of scientific naturalism and its imagined opposite, supernaturalism. And in the next lecture, I will outline how that trick was done and what the real history looks like. Thank you. So we have around about, um, I think, about 10 minutes just for some uh, questions and observations. So uh, the floor is open. The roving mic will come around as well. If you'd like to raise your hand in the usual way. Thank you. Hi, Peter. Thank you for another brilliant lecture. Um, I just wanted to push back a little bit on what you said about the rise of the term supernatural uh, and, and how it wasn't used in the time when supernaturalism was pre you know, prevalent. And my guess would be the same would be if you did a word study of the word medieval. Uh, you wouldn't find anybody using that prior to a later period. And so I'm just, I'm just wondering about how, how helpful that evidence actually is. Sorry, let me, let, let me just get this clear. The, the evidence about... The, the, use, the use of the term supernaturalism didn't come around to the 19th century, and you, right. you circled that you know, yeah. this really wasn't used prior to then. Yeah, yeah. I'll say, um, so, what, yeah, I, I, I've got that. Now. So what was the question that follows as a consequence of that? <laughs> <laughs> just keep talking. There, yeah. <laughs> I, I can always keep talking. Um, Sorry, I'm now getting feedback. Um, the, the question really has to do with uh, how, how useful that is, if that's simply a new term being used in, in historical development. So you could use other terms like medieval and see that they were not being used earlier, but that's actually not evidence of anything. This is an excellent point, and, and so one of the, you know, the, the general issue it, that relates to the, the general issue that relates to a lot of the research I do that traces word histories and then places a, 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 a sort of burden on them in terms of what conceptual shifts they track is whether there are other words that are doing the same work, or whether there are concepts or sets of assumptions that do the same work. And to some extent, that is that is going to be the case. It's just not in this case. Now, how, how do we know that? Well, we've got to do the kind of Wittgensteinian thing about words and use and look at forms of life and so on. But, I mean, I have a strong conviction uh, as in my work, and I'll talk about this, if we have time this afternoon, about the kind of work that conceptual categories do and the way in which they shape our capacity to see the world in particular ways. And so the, the general point I would want to make is that that changing terminologies are not just a matter of semantic interest, but, but represent significant shifts in our capacity to see and not see things. And I take your point in that 
destroying that circle around the period when supernaturalism doesn't do the work, okay? That doesn't do the job. But I do have, I do have an array of arguments that will do the job um, if you're prepared to, um, to, to hang around this afternoon. And then you can get back to me if you're not happy. An afternoon of this, but there we are. Thank you. Yeah. Just the microphone coming. Thanks. As Huxley and his contemporaries were beginning to drive forward the agenda that you've just described so clearly, to what extent was there a reaction and what was the nature of the reaction from those people at that time and subsequently who did maintain um, uh, a faith, which might have been a Christian faith, or, 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 but at least a belief in God? Yes. So that, that, that's a good question. And again, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, the reaction. And, and your hero, Maxwell, is actually part of that story. Because what's interesting is that the most prestigious scientists at the time were pretty much committed theists. And guys like the, the Irishman Tyndall and Huxley, these are, these are guys who are outsiders, not educated at Oxford, but, you know, Edinburgh, UCL, they're, they're, they're not insiders. And so there's a, there's a very interesting political story about what's going on here. And what Hen Thomas Henry Huxley is desperate to do is to increase the social prestige, prestige of, of science and, crucially, to make it independent of interference from ecclesiastical... Uh, well, what they regard as ecclesiastical interference. And, and John Tyndall, again, we'll see this in the next lecture, John Tyndall too. So there's a sense in which the, these guys are, are kind of have an anti-establishment agenda and they see an alliance between the men of science, as they were known, and, and uh, Anglicanism and establishment, generally speaking. So these guys were the outsiders. And again, what, what's interesting is that the way the story is typically told is that these guys really are uh, representative and that their victory is an easy one. And it wasn't. It was very hard. And just to give you one classic example of how this works out, um, 1860 was also this, the, the year of the famous Oxford debate held in the history of uh, the Museum of Natural History here, where Huxley and Wilberforce had this famous exchange. And the way the myth is told that Huxley trounced Wilberforce, no, that didn't happen at all. Huxley was not much of a rhetorician at this stage, and Wilberforce was brilliant. He had the stuff and knew how to talk. Wilberforce clearly won that debate. But that's not the history we get. So that, to come back to your question, yes, there was a strong opposition. These guys were really up against it. But it's again the story of the history being told by the victors in a way. And so we have this distorted view that Huxley and uh, Darwin and Tyndall just had it all their own way. And that certainly wasn't the case. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask about uh, whether there might have been a side conversation um, happening about the idea of renaturalization or denaturalization instead of this schema of supernature and nature as kind of bifurcated categories that are warring against each other. Were there other voices that were suggesting a different schema at the time? Yes, I mean, ab absolutely. And we've got to remember that sort of romanticism is still a key thing here. Um, we've, we've got versions of vitalism. So, so the question then is wh wh why I'm choosing the particular trajectory that I am. And so what I'm interested in is how we got to be where we are, where we are all naturalists, is the, is the kind of rhetoric. And in a, in a way, this goes also back to Andrew's question, that there's a whole range of competing views going on at the time. And the, the sort of victory of, of naturalism was a hard-fought one. But we, we, we construct the, the history backwards. And it looks like that this, is, you know, this discussion is kind of the only game in town, and that's certainly not the case. But, but all of the other things that are going on I'm excluding from my account because I'm really interested in, in how from this you know, fairly f f fragile uh, beginnings, these guys managed to be remarkably successful in putting this myth over on us because I think this is a, is a very... This, this naturalist, scientific naturalism is, as, as Papineau suggests, for philosophers, the only game in town. <laughs>
Um, and so, so again, yes, much more going on, um, so I'm interested in its modest beginnings. We may have time for one more brief question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Regarding the analysis of um, spiritualism um, by so-called scientific means, um, you didn't mention Oliver Lodge and Conan Doyle, who yes. fit very, very well into the pattern you've spoken about. Yes, you, it, exactly. Um, I will mention them in the next lecture, but they'll be in a long list, okay? But you're right. They're, they're classic examples of the kind of thing that I'm... They're, they're classic examples of the kind of thing I'm speaking about, and they, they nicely exemplify the, the point about naturalism is not just the only game in town. <laughs>